Hey everyone, it's Mr. Bennett. We are going to do a really, really fast evolution overview. Uh, this is meant for review. You can go back and look at the other videos if you're looking for more detailed information. So we're looking at, uh, we've got evolution. Remember, this is change over time. And there are two kind of subunits. We've got microevolution, and then there's macroevolution. And we're going to start over here on the left with microevolution. Um, Darwin was kind of the first guy to start to describe this stuff. So he was on his trip to the Galapagos. He noticed that finches uh, had different beak shapes. And so he started to think what could cause these different beak shapes to form from the same species. And so he came up with these five ideas about what causes speciation or the changes in species over time. Um, so we're going to start off with allopatric speciation. And this is when you have different regions. There are uh, organisms that are geographically isolated, so they're not overlapping in any way. And just because of their regions, different resources, different pressures, they, they speciate. Um, and this is typically what happens when you um, have uh, vast migrations or different regions where species um, start to populate at the population level. And we'll look at that in a minute. Sympatric speciation is similar, only this time we're talking about species in the same region starting to speciate into different um, individual groups. And this typically happens through mutations. There's random genetic mutations that can happen, um, and eventually some of those individuals will begin to diverge and form their own species um, over a few hundred thousand years or millions of years. Adaptive radiation is another one, and this is when you have multiple adaptations or multiple species from a single origin. Uh, so instead of one group splitting into two, like we typically think of with allopatric and sympatric, adaptive radiation could have multiple groups adapting uh, from one origin due to, again, selective pressures. This would be um, birds on the Hawaiian Islands. They are geographically in the same region, but they all have their own adaptations to meet their own individual needs. Reproductive isolation is the ability of these organisms to interbreed and increase their genetic pool. So as reproductive isolation increases, um, meaning these things are diverging more and more, that starts to get us toward a new species. And then habitual, or habitat influence rather. Um, so this could be food sources, selective pressures, natural selection, um, causing individuals to adapt uh, and to form new survival strategies that eventually speciate them into something new. Um, so those are his five ideas, uh, and the microevolution, we can do this, this work called phylogeny. And remember, phylogeny is based on genetics, morphology, and protein structure, essentially, which ties in with the genetics, right? So morphology is a good one. We can look at similar structures on animals um, or plants and start to compare um, if there are common ancestors or not. Uh, genetics would be like DNA sequencing. Um, and protein would fall under kind of the genetic sequencing stuff. So we can look at any class, anything that's hereditary in nature. Um, these organisms, they have a common ancestor, and that common ancestor is then branched off. Remember, any of these nodes, so let me zoom in on that. So we've got this tree. Any of these nodes can rotate. So time is typically on the x-axis going left to right from older on the left to newer on the right, but it's arbitrary. Vertical doesn't mean anything really, and you are looking at the nodes. So I can take this node right here and I can rotate it with no change in this, in this cladogram. Um, individuals connected to the same node are said to be in clades and they're more related than individuals on different nodes. Um, so we've, we did a, a large poll on this, and there's a lot of good videos on how to read and construct cladograms, so you can go take a look at those. So that's microevolution in 3 minutes and 50 seconds. On the other side, we've got population genetics. This is macroevolution. Macroevolution looks at the change in populations over time. Uh, so we've got a population here uh, with a lot of blue-faced people and this one orange-faced dude. Maybe he's got a, uh, this could be a dominant trait, maybe. Um, or a new trait emerges that gives him a competitive advantage, and over time that population starts to shift. Uh, those genes begin to shift. We can track this and measure it using the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium equation, which says that if our allele frequency is at 1, so 100% of the alleles, uh, we can look at the square, so this would be a homozygous individual, uh, uh, homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive and Q squared, and the 2PQ would be your heterozygotes. And the sum of all those things is all of the alleles in the population. 
and you reach an equilibrium when these five conditions are met. So we have random mating, no migration, large population um, to avoid genetic drift. Uh, there is no selective pressure at all and no mutations in that population. And if those things are met, you are said to be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Uh, and we can use these principles to talk about whether or not a population is truly shifting one direction or the other. So you should be able to uh, take some data and calculate the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Um, for that population and then make a judgment call. Is it shifting? Is it not? Why? Why not? Look at the pressures. Which of the conditions isn't being met? Things like that. Um, there's also reproductive strategies included in macro. Uh, so there are different kinds of reproductive uh, habits that organisms have um, over time. So as time increases from left to right on both of these graphs, two, they do two things. One, you could have the J curve. Shoop, it comes up. This is the boom and bust cycle. So insects, uh, mosquitoes, every summer they have this boom and they just rise and rise and rise and rise and rise. Remember this gray line is the carrying capacity. They blast past the carrying capacity and then eventually you run out of resources or there's too much competition or there's a disease and that population crashes and then it starts to rebuild itself. But it's this boom, bust, boom, bust over and over and over again. Then there's these S-curves where you have a quick quick growth. So it looks like exponential growth, but then instead of busting, your population starts to uh, due to selective pressures, um, again, uh, it could be a niche, food, uh, habitat space, whatever, causes that population to fall. And then once you're below the carrying capacity, you kind of level up and you kind of hover right along um, the carrying capacity. So these are typically animals with longer lifespans, like humans, elephants, even though our human curve um, is starting to look more like a J curve like that, which is a little bit terrifying. Um, over time, these populations will, will kind of level themselves out. Elephants follow this population curve in particular. That's kind of the classic example. Um, so make sure you can describe the reproductive strategies of different organisms um, and how they affect the population, uh, specifically within the, the Hardy-Weinberg um, construct. Uh, so again, that was a really, really fast overview of evolution, both micro and macro. Uh, take a look back at some of the old material, some of the stuff in your notes, uh, some of the old videos um, to get more detailed information.